And thank you for having me. And I thought since this track is called the blockchain track, I thought I should talk a bit about blockchain because while it's been very interesting up until now, we've talked mostly about cryptocurrencies, tokens, and the financial aspect of it. This will be more about the technology and how I think it should, and primarily how it shouldn't be used. Because there are lots of misunderstandings out there. There's still a lot of hype and still a lot of lacking information. And the problem is that if you buy the hype and you try to develop an app with a wrong understanding of what this technology can and can't do, you'll figure it out a bit too late if you're an investor or entrepreneur because you'll be screwed. And since I have way too many slides, I'll start with my conclusion, which is whatever you do, don't do it on the blockchain. Feel free to leverage a blockchain, to use a blockchain, but don't do it on the blockchain. Hopefully what that means will be clearer through my presentation. So we already talked a lot about blockchain, blockchain DLT. And the problem is that there are more people talking about this, uh, this technology than there are people understanding it. You have presenters uh, throwing around buzzwords and emptying the kind of the meaning of the word. It means everything and nothing. And that's a problem if you're to understand what you can do with it. Most people and most presenters will tell you that a blockchain is some sort of distributed database leveraging cryptography so that you get some sil magic silver bullet properties so that you can use it for everything. That you can use it for uh, health data, for uh, tracking fish in the value chain, that you can do super fast, super secure, super private, super transparent transactions in this magical thing called the blockchain. Well, in the reality, a blockchain, technically speaking, is on their data structure. It's on the way to store data where you add new information without deleting the old information. And here you use cryptography to put a link back to the previous state or the previous um, kind of version of the log so that you cannot change it without invalidating the log. This used to be called a cryptographic linked list and it's not a new technology. And since the blockchain, technically speaking, is only this log, not the distributed database, its, primary, uh, kind of its uh, primary function is as a timestamp server, a way to order events in time, to be a log. It's not somewhere where you store massive amounts of data. Of course, any data structure could technically be defined as a database. The problem is that when you call it a database, you think about data structures that are optimized for handling large amounts of data. A log is not optimized for handling large amounts of data. It's optimized for handling metadata, transaction data, small data types. And you do it because you want to kind of uh, have a, uh, information about what's, been ha what's happened and when. The fundamental value of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency-based blockchains uh, is that the blockchain is open and decentralized. So the new thing is not to have a log, but to have a log where every person in the world agrees on what's in the log, yet nobody controls it. That's never existed before. Pre-Bitcoin, that was impossible. It was not just difficult. It didn't just require a lot of computing capacity, which is now cheap and available, which is the case for AI. It was impossible. It wasn't until Satoshi Nakamoto came up with the idea of using a cryptocurrency to incentivize behavior which could keep the ledger secure while still being open and decentralized, this was possible. And the blockchain, this data structure, is only one part of these systems that make them work. There's so many other technical components. And while people in kind of general everyday speaking talk about a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum as the blockchain, the whole network, what they're then really talking about is in finite time respective, consensus-based and replicated cryptographic state machines. Quite a mouthful. For most people, it suffice to kind of dub this to magic internet money. You don't need to understand it if you're not going to use it. But if you are to invest in this space, if you are to develop an application using this technology, you have to understand every single part of what this system is. You have to understand what it means that it is infinite. The time respectiveness is the blockchain. And since I only have 10 minutes to talk, I'll only focus on one element here, which is the replicated part. 
because it's not only decentralized, it's decentralized in a very peculiar way by replication. And that means that state, which most people think of as data storage, is expensive because every node in a network has to store everything. Every computation you do on a blockchain has been done by every node. And since it's done by every node, it's not very private. So that means that if you're going to use this technology, you'll want to try, at least if you want to be efficient or cost efficient and have some privacy, to avoid using the blockchain. You want to do as much as possible off-chain. And there are different solutions for doing that. You have what is called second layer technology, which basically is a way to ensure local consensus instead of the global consensus which you have in the blockchains. Through the threat of external enforcement. This means that you can run your smart contract, provably secure, outside of the blockchain. This is, for instance, what's been leveraged by the Lightning Network, enabling microtransactions like streaming of money outside of the Bitcoin blockchain. And you can think about the blockchain as a supreme court. It's really, really expensive to take a, a dispute through the whole judiciary system until you end up with a supreme court. But the beauty of having a stable, robust, and predictable supreme court is that you can solve most disputes outside of the judiciary system because both parties know what will happen if you were to take the case to Supreme Court. The blockchain and uh, like Ethereum and Bitcoin is kind of the programmable, 100% secure version of that. Since you know that you can take the smart contract, take the transactions you're doing and settle it on the underlying blockchain if you have to, you don't have to. So me and some other parties can transact peer-to-peer -peer without sharing our transactions with the rest of the world, without having to trust each other. We only have to trust that if we suddenly disagree with each other and have a dispute, we can settle on the underlying blockchain, and since we both know what will happen, we don't have to do that. So we can do our transactions off-chain, which is way more efficient. The other thing people talk about in relation with blockchains is the benefit of ensuring data integrity, to make sure that you haven't tampered with the data, that the data hasn't been changed since uh, you saw it last time, for instance. And blockchains are great for this, but don't store the data in the blockchain itself. Store the fingerprint of the data in the blockchain. You don't put your holiday pictures on the blockchain, which is then replicated to thousands of nodes around the world. You take the digital fingerprint of those pictures and put it in the blockchain. And you can do that by using protocols like Factum, which is optimized for tracking how documents evolve over time and anchor the kind of the version of the document into the Bitcoin blockchain. So you, have an, you can use this for notary purposes, where you can prove that some document existed at a given point in time, that you had ownership of it in that point in time, and that it hasn't changed since. Data anchored into public blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain has been used as proof in court cases, both in the US and China. So for all means, uh, uh, use the blockchain to kind of ensure data integrity, but don't put the data in the blockchain. You don't want to share it with everyone. And even if it's encrypted, you don't want it on the blockchain, because if that key, which you use to encrypt the data, is lost some point in the future, all of your data will be available for everyone to decrypt. That's not a good situation. And lastly, it's not only data that can be anchored into a blockchain. More importantly, you can anchor identities, which means that all the decentralized apps people are talking about can be run off-chain, most of them at least, not all of them. Uh, for instance, if you want to create a decentralized version of Facebook, you don't want to do it directly on the blockchain, directly on a replicated system where every person has to process and save every other person's image. I mean, you don't want an internet where every browser has to download every web page, run through every script, being it malicious or not, before you can browse the web. You want to have this local. You want a social network where you share information directly with your friend, but without going through a middleman and without sharing it with the whole world. And digital identity is really, really important. It's uh, the, the way we can interact securely electronically, and since it was impossible to have it decentralized and self uh, sovereign, these companies have kind of gained a lot of control in our digital lives. How, um, how much time do I have? About one more minute. One more minute. I'll be quick. So if you look at the, uh, the development of uh, digital identities, it used to be that 
case that you signed up with some organization, you had one account there, it was a silo, you had another account with someone else. Very inconvenient. So you had third party providers like Facebook, Bank ID, social login, where you can log into your Spotify using Facebook. Spotify gives you a credential, send it to your digital identity managed by Facebook, saying that you have actually access to Spotify Premium. The problem is that if uh, Facebook shuts you out of their service, you shut out from uh, Spotify as well. The solution to this is what's called self sovereign identity, where the data identity is anchored into the public blockchain, so that your wallet, the mobile wallet you could uh, use to hold your cryptocurrency, also can be used to hold your digital identity. So that different organizations can write credentials to your identity. So it's your wallet, you have different membership cards in that, it's just going to be digital. And if uh, one of those organizations said, well, you're not a user anymore, it doesn't affect the rest of your kind of credentials. And this enables a Facebook, a decentralized Facebook, where you only share data directly with your counterparties. And we're already seeing the emergence of these services replicating the existing systems, but doing it all off-chain, only anchoring the identity so that people can interact securely without a middleman, but keeping the data stored at their local provider. And to round this up, off, I think it's very, very important to understand that a blockchain uh, it's not a one-stop shop for decentralization. If you look at solutions like OpenBazaar, a decentralized version of eBay, if you like, they're achieving this decentralization by combining different technologies, by combining IPFS for decentralized storage, cryptocurrency for decentralized payment, and then block uh, stack, which is this decentralized ID system, to together create a decentralized app. So don't uh, treat a blockchain as a one-stop shop. So, Programmable money and self sovereign identity, the ability to kind of sign things digitally without a middleman, are the platforms from which the internet of value and the decentralized web will emerge. The blockchain is not the platform. The blockchain is only one of the tools, a tool that is really expensive, it's really useful, but you want to use it as little as possible. And that's why it's so extremely powerful, because you don't have to use it, because you can use it if you have to. So that's why you don't have to. Want to learn more about it? And you're Norwegian uh, or Norwegian speaking, check out cryptographen.no. Thanks.